coming up on Colonial Crossfire. The Iran nuclear deal. Religious freedom laws. And Rand Paul enters the fray. Joining us on the left, Ethan Arsht. On the right, Nate D'Amico. And I'm your moderator, Andrew Desiderio. This is Colonial Crossfire. A framework is set for the Iran nuclear deal, but will it hold? Welcome to Colonial Crossfire. I'm Andrew Desiderio. The U.S. and other major powers agreed to a framework that supporters say will make it more likely that Iran will never have a nuclear bomb. But critics contend the constraints on Iran will not be in any way verifiable and could actually make it easier for Iran to get a bomb. Here to analyze that and more, our student panel. On the left, Ethan Arsht, a sophomore from Park City, Utah, majoring in Middle East Studies. Ethan is a member of the GW debate team and has worked on several Democratic political campaigns. On the right, Nate D'Amico, a junior from Connecticut majoring in political science. Nate is the political affairs director for the College Republicans. Thanks to both of you for joining us. While the parameters signed off on are simply a framework, the Obama administration says Iran has agreed to eliminate two-thirds of its centrifuges. In addition, Iran said it will not enrich uranium over a certain limit for the next 15 years. Now, in order for sanctions to be lifted, Iran must prove that it will abide by those rules. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says there would be no way to verify that. Netanyahu believes the framework agreed upon will actually make it easier for Iran to attain nuclear capability. It does not block Iran's path to the bomb. Such a deal paves Iran's path to the bomb. And it might very well spark a nuclear arms race throughout the Middle East, and it would greatly increase the risks of terrible war. The survival of Israel is non-negotiable. Israel will not accept an agreement which allows a country that vows to annihilate us to develop nuclear weapons, period. Meanwhile, CIA Director John Brennan called Netanyahu's criticisms wholly disingenuous of the facts. So Ethan, are the Prime Minister's claims legitimate? Well, Andrew, when you think about what Benjamin Netanyahu said, you have to consider it in terms of the alternatives for the U.S. in dealing with Iran. The way I see it, there are two real alternatives for the U.S. There is stick with the status quo, which would be a disa which would be problematic. We can get back to that, or go to war with Iran, which is equally problematic because it entails a huge military intervention, which couldn't possibly end well from the U.S. from an international standpoint, or from the uh, or from achieving our goals. It's extremely difficult to find the to find all of their secret facilities. Right, but don't you think Iran maybe should have put in there, you know, acknowledged Israel's right to exist as a state? I mean, Obama, Obama just, said, uh, just said the other day, look, if we put that in there, we're asking Iran to change the makeup of their entire regime. It's impossible to do that. We have to find the spots where we can agree and take advantage of those smaller agreements. Mm -hmm. Nate, so in a New York Times editorial, the supporters mm -hmm. of this deal say that it's a promising deal um, and that Americans support such a solution. Do you agree with that? Um, personally, I wholly disagree. I think what you have here is a pretty clear-cut issue of a president who has a, an abysmal foreign policy record, um, a lot of problems around the world, and right now he's trying to salvage not only his own legacy, but make the field uh, a little bit easier for a Democratic replacement in 2016. And I think what you have here is him rushing at any cost to try and get a deal. You know, you have an Iranian regime which has never held true to any promise or agreement it's made. They've been in a state of war against us officially since 1979, I believe, sometime in the 70s. Um, you know, you have a leader who on one day we're having these uh, good faith negotiations with Iran. The next day the Ayatollah Khomeini is coming out and saying death to America, death to Israel, death to the great and little Satan. Um, I, I disagree with you. I don't think our choice right now is between uh, the status quo and war. I, I do wholly agree that war is uh, not an option that I ever want us to have to engage in. Um, but the reason that these deals are happening in the first place is that the sanctions we have right now against Iran are crippling them. And I think that we are very much invested in and should be working to change the regime. Yeah. And Israel is you know, our biggest ally in the Middle East, and I think they're a big part of that. And I want to bring up something you mentioned. This is actually one of the few times where Iran, I mean, sorry, Israel and the Sunni Arab nations are actually allied with each other against the U.S. because they feel like, you know, the U.S. Mm -hmm. is 
uh, I guess, rewarding Iran with li uh, lifting the sanctions for their aggression in the region, um, specifically how they're backing the, the Houthi rebels in Yemen who are overthrowing the government there. Um, and of course, Saudi Arabia got involved in airstrikes. So Ethan, doesn't that seem a little bit convoluted, that narrative there? Sure. I mean, I still think it's important that we negotiate with the Iranian regime right now. The reason why is because if we don't, if we don't make this deal happen, we lose Rouhani in Iran. He will lose the next election unless he can bring some back some results from the people because he won the election mm -hmm. campaigning on sanction, re sanction relief. That means that if we embarrass him, he's going to lose the next election and the window for negotiation has closed completely. Now, uh, in terms of dealing with the Gulf states and the Sunni states in, uh, in the Middle East, some of them have begrudgingly, admittedly accepted that this deal has to happen. Uh, now, Saudi Arabia, of course, opposed these negotiations from the beginning, but they at least <clears throat> have accepted that, yes, there will probably be a deal, and yes, that uh, it probably makes the, reg the, the region slightly safer. Right, and a potential roadblock to this, I guess, would be the fact that uh, in Congress you have several Republicans, but also uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, who's a very intru influential Democrat, who's saying they want Congress to have the final say of this deal. I guess that you could call that a potential roadblock to the president's, uh, what he calls a prerogative of the executive branch, right, Nate? Right, I mean, legally in the framework of the Constitution, it is the uh, legislative branch which is supposed to ratify and verify treaties that are uh, entered into by by the United States, but um, I, I think the Middle East obviously is a very complex situation at all times. Uh, right now we find ourselves in a situation where we and Iran are both on the same side of oppo um, opposing the ISIS uh, militants in Syria and Iraq. Um, so I, I think you often end up in these situations where we have very, very uh, opposing forces who kind of come together, um, if not allied, then um, on the same side of an issue. Um, and, but that's something people forget a lot, is that the rest of the Middle East also has a huge problem with Iran. It's not just us, it's not just Israel, it's many of the other uh, Islamic states as well. Ethan, do you agree with Senator Schumer that Congress should have the final say? Uh, if the deal that they come to, when they hash out all the details, revoke sanctions that were ratified by Congress, yes, Congress should, the, the pre president should not be able to override an act of Congress. However, if they can just eliminate sanctions, that the executive branch put in place, yeah, that's the executive branch's prerogative. It's a deal, not a treaty in that case. Okay, and I want to go back to, to the U.S.'s overall involvement in here. Um, how involved should the U.S. be? Should they have been in getting this framework set, Nate? Um, I, I think this is something, the United States still is a major global player, um, whether or not you want us to be, whether or not other nations want us to be. Um, and. When it comes down to it, Iran is one of the greatest threats to the United States. It's one of the greatest threats to world peace and security. Um, and I personally, if, if you examine the um, philosophy of the theocratic regime in Iran, the whole point of their uh, branch of Islam is that they believe in the concept of the 12th Imam who's going to return and like cleanse the world and bring the world under the, uh, under the rule of the Muslim people. And I, I think the goal of this uh, regime, and you can agree or disagree with me on that, is to prepare the world for this and make this happen. They are making preparations right now for that. And I think that the problem that you have is that this is a regime that if they do, um, if they do acquire nuclear capabilities, if they don't use it, they have a huge history of sponsoring ter state terror are being a state sponsor of terror, um, mm -hmm. especially against Israel. And I think if you have a situation where they acquire that capability, even if they don't use it themselves, there's a very, very high probability that they're going to shop it out to somebody else. Right, so, so Ethan, why do you think there's two, like the facts are the same uh, of, <coughs> of the framework. Everybody's saying the same thing in terms of what's in the framework. But it seems a little interesting that Netanyahu is saying this paves the way to, to Iran getting a bomb, but the U.S. is saying something completely different based on the same set of facts that are in the framework. Why do you think there's that narrative there? Right, and I would add that uh, the Ayatollah has said something completely different to the people uh, in Iran. And the right. truth is everyone mm -hmm. has, to appease their, uh, can, has to appease their base. Yeah. Right? The Ayatollah says one thing because he has to appease the hardliners in Iran. Obama says another thing because he has to uh, appease some of the lobbies here in the U.S. And then Netanyahu has always been against these negotiations. He's not going to back down on that front now. He has to maintain that these negotiations are a threat to Israel. All the same, this makes it more difficult for Iran to get the bomb than what we had before. Like, mm -hmm. any way you look at it, they are further from a bomb. They're not, it's not impossible for them to get a bomb. They're further from a bomb than they were before this deal. 
before right. this framework. All right, Nate, quick prediction. Do you mm -hmm. think um, this framework will hold and that we'll actually get a deal over the summer? Quick prediction. Um, I think that there's a very good chance that a, that a deal will be signed. Uh, just really quickly to Ethan's point, um, I disagree with Netanyahu. I don't think it paves the way for them. I do agree that it, it does make it harder for them to get a bomb. But I think at the end of the day that you cannot trust this regime and that you cannot verify that they're going to do what they're going to say. Ethan, very quick prediction on your part. Uh, I think that a deal happens a diminished deal from what came out in the framework, uh, but a, a deal will get ratified. All right, we shall see, and of course the devil is in the details. Coming up, we'll examine the fine line between religious liberty and discrimination, next. The George Washington University, at the intersection of policy, practice, and research. Connecting all that Washington has to offer with an intellectual environment that drives progress. Transforming vision into action offering learning experiences that are rigorous, real-time, and real-world. In a city shaping the future, George Washington is a place where faculty and students don't just study the world, they work to change it. It's been pretty busy around here with parcel and flex plans going on sale, so we need an extra pair of hands around the office. Let's go, G! We had no idea he would bring the Colonial Army. Whoosh! Ah, up! Ah, up! Hey, hey, George, uh, I think you have an update for Firefox. Never mind. <laughs> Welcome back. Indiana lawmakers admitted when they passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that they were not expecting the backlash it ultimately received. After Republican Governor Mike Pence signed the bill into law, everyone from Hillary Clinton to Apple CEO Tim Cook and even the NCAA criticized the law. Some governors even banned government-funded travel to Indiana for state employees. According to supporters, the law gives businesses the right to use their religion as a legal defense. But others say the law opens the door to government-sanctioned anti-gay discrimination and is overall bad for business. Pence took to the airwaves to defend his decision to sign the act saying there's been misinformation spread about it in the media. The purpose of this legislation, which is the law in all 50 states in our federal courts, and it's the law by either statute or court decisions in some 30 other states, is very simply to empower individuals when they believe that actions of government impinge on their constitutional First Amendment freedom of religion. But after continued scrutiny, Pence and GOP state lawmakers were forced to draft a so-called fix to the law, which clarifies that businesses cannot refu refuse to serve gay customers or same-sex weddings. So Nate, was that fix even necessary in your mind? Um, so I think the fix was a good idea because it kind of clears up the issue. Um, I think that one of the, the biggest issues with the bill is misinformation, as Penn said. Um, the name association is a little bit unfortunate when it says Religious Freedom Restoration Act. There's an association, obviously, with uh, protecting religious beliefs, which it does. But what this bill really is trying to get at is it's saying that no person should be forced to do something that goes against their beliefs. Um, and that applies equally to, um, say, a, a print shop run by a gay couple, uh, which you know, if the Westboro Baptist Church comes in and says, hey, you know, we want you to make us some shirts that say, the things that we all know them very well for saying, right. um, I think that that couple should have every right to say, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, if, a, if a Jewish business owner is asked to make a, um, <laughs> a uh, something for a KKK rally or for a, a Nazi group in America, I think what this is trying to say is that nobody should be forced to do something that disagrees with them. We've had governments that try to do that. that the Soviet Union told you when, where, and how to work. We don't do that here. So Ethan, was the original bill, um, was mm -hmm. the intent of it to discriminate against gay people? And if not, what was the intent in your mind? Yes, the intent was discri to discriminate against gay people. Some of the lawmakers who sponsored and signed or, or voted for that bill, not Mike Pence, but some of the state uh, senators said, the intent of this is to strengthen religion and strengthen Christianity against uh, homosexuality. And uh, after the fix, all this bill does is it brings it in line with the previous 1992 uh, federal act that was the Religious Freedom the one Restoration that Bill Clinton Act. Signed. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so after the fix, this bill doesn't do anything. Before the fix, it slightly strengthened the ability of uh, corporations to not serve gay people. Right, and that's a good point because Angie's List, um, a company that's based in Indiana, said they won't expand 
uh, because of the law. And after the fix was passed, they still said it was insufficient because it never changed the existing law that you talked about, the 1992 law, the federal one. Um, but do you think private businesses on any grounds have the right to refuse service to anyone uh, under the free market, say? Yes, they can refuse service, but not because of questions of identity, color, um, sexual orientation, right? Mm -hmm. They can refuse uh, business because you're rowdy and you, uh, you know, uh, vandalize their storefront, right. right? You can't refuse. You can't refuse business to anyone based on a question of mm -hmm. identity. So what do you say? Nate? But but that's the problem that nobody is saying. You know, shop owners in Indiana aren't putting up gay detectors in their doorways and saying, oh, you know, you're, you're a homosexual, you can't come in here. The problem isn't that they're turning these people away. The problem is that they're saying there are very specific things in which they will not engage. You know, printing a cake that has uh, an endorsement of gay marriage on it. It's, it's not that they're denying business whole, completely across the board to people on the basis of gender, race, uh, ethnicity, uh, sexuality. It's that there are very specific cases in which there is a small, something that violates their beliefs. And as I said, it would, re it would work in the reverse situation as well. Um, it's not saying, you know, you're gay, you can't come in here. It's saying, I don't agree with the specific message that you're, that you're trying to promote. I will not engage in that specific activity, not that I will not serve you carte blanche. We're, right, but can't the bill, you know, as Ethan said, can't people use the bill if they want to, to refuse service to gay people? Can't they do that under I the bill? I think people can certainly try to, um, but the problem is that that is not protected under the bill. Um, there have been a couple of cases, and suits that have been tried under similar bills in other states, uh, such as the episode with the uh, the wedding, the the uh, family that tried to deny the wedding service, the other uh, bakery issue, those suits were uh, dismissed and the government basically said this is not a legitimate cause. The way you're approaching this is not sufficient uh, for you to deny them based on this. So, so far it hasn't ever been used to discriminate against a, a gay couple or any other type of uh, person. Yeah, so Ethan, are the media kind of to blame here, as Mike Pence said, for <coughs> s uh, spreading maybe misinformation about the bill? Um, when it was first reported, uh, you know, people said they could just um, refuse service to gay people, which wasn't exactly true. It was, it was, you know, more focused on the issue of same-sex weddings, you know, if you want to get a florist or a photographer or a caterer or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, do, you, do you buy that argument that there was, you know, maybe some misinformation out there in the media to start with? I, I absolutely buy that buy that argument that the media did uh, hype this up. They did sort of uh, uh, make the, especially the uh, liberal media made this look like it was a lot more discriminatory than the actual text of the bill supported. Mm -hmm. Now, I still think there are two things about this bill that are extremely problematic. The first is that they uh, allow people to uh, refuse service based on based on identity. Sure, they could refuse service before, they just had to come up with an excuse that wasn't identity. The mm -hmm. second thing is that, the, um, is that a number of the people who, who voted for the bill said, we're voting for this bill because we think it hurts gay people. Mm -hmm. That is the problem. It's not as much the text of the bill as the motivation for the bill. And because of that motivation, it's reason to believe this bill would lead to things that are more discriminatory. On that point, do you think the U.S. is now engaged in, as some commentators have said, some sort of, you know, um, culture war over religious freedom and gay, gay rights, sort of the line between those two things? Um, not exactly, given how little violence you see on, right. these, on these questions, given what we've historically called culture wars in this country. They've usually been uh, involved a lot more people, and they've also been more violent. I would say that it's definitely a conflict, an ideological conflict. I would not call it a culture war. What do you think, Nate? Um, I, I would have to agree, I think, with Ethan. Um, you know, one of his points is it's a very small percentage of the population. The, the population of Americans that are, uh, you know, vehemently opposed to gay marriage or uh, homosexuality is a small segment. Um, the population that is vehemently fighting back is also a small segment. Um, and at the, at the end of the day, we've had a history of these things throughout America's uh, time. You know, when the Irish and Italian immigrants came in, uh, other Catholic immigrants. Uh, we've had plenty of um, social and cultural disagreements in America. I think the beauty of it is that in what the ideals of this country is, we move forward, we have debate, discussion, and um, we move past it. Just quickly on the point of the media, I do think it was whipped up a bit. I think that's kind of the media, uh, what they see as their job today is to kind of turn into everything into a, 
a circus. Um, I think it, they made it a little bit more serious than it had to be, but there are legitimate criticisms to be made, and I'm glad that there was discussion that led to uh, changes. I want to go back to something Ethan said in the beginning that I asked mm -hmm. him about, um, whether the original bill without the fix was intended to discriminate against gay people. Do you think it was? Um, I think, as Ethan said, there, there are certain people who supported it who did have that intention. Um, I don't think that the broader purpose of the bill, I don't think Pence's purpose in signing it was specifically to discriminate against um, homosexual couples or, or other, on the basis of other uh, sexuality and, and gender issues. Um, I really do personally view it through a lens of uh, freedom of expression and freedom of belief. Um, and like I said, this, this applies to everybody. Anybody can say this is in violation with the things that I hold fundamentally dear to me, and they can uh, do that. I, I do think that there were some problems with statements made by certain people. I think that's very unfortunate, um, but I, I don't think the broader purpose of the bill is to uh, you know, shackle the rights of uh, gay people in Indiana. Ethan, quickly, I want to uh, bring up something that the governor of North Carolina mm -hmm. said, Governor McCrory, um, who, he's a Republican, he basically said, I don't see the, the need for such a law. Um, we already have one on the books federally. Um, you know, he said, what's the problem they're trying to solve here? Um, so what do you think of Governor McCrory's I completely there? agree with that, and that's the real problem with this bill. Either mm -hmm. it is a mere image of the, of the federal version of this law, and thus does nothing, or it's an intention to allow for further discrimination, right? right. Mm -hmm. Clinton already said that you're allowed to uh, maintain your religious beliefs in the workplace. Right. Okay, and uh, that's a very, uh, very testy topic as we, c we can see in the national media, but um, we'll see what happens with it. Uh, after this break, it's rapid fire. Stay with us. It's on us. To stand up to those who tell us it's not our business. To tell our friends if what they're doing is wrong. It's on us. To do something, anything, to keep an assault from happening. To be more than a bystander. To create an environment where women feel and are safe. It's on us to change the way we talk about women. To be part of the solution, not part of the problem. It's on us. To say something when our friends are being stupid. To hold our friends accountable for their actions. It's on us to, to look, look out, out for, for someone, someone who's had, who's too, had much too much to drink. to drink. To step in if a friend is doing something that could lead to sexual assault. It's on us. To not give our friends a pass. To never blame the victim. To stop a sexual assault any way we can. I am a member of the George Washington University community, and it's on us to end sexual violence. Welcome back. Our panel joins us again for rapid fire, some quick answers to some quick questions. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul just became the second Republican to jump into the 2016 presidential race. Nate, do you think he has a chance to win the Republican nomination? Um, I think Rand is a very strong candidate. He has a huge backing. Um, he is... Uh, Obviously, on some issues, more conservative. On other issues, such as legalization, he's a little bit more lax. He also uh, recently put forward a bill with uh, Cory Booker, Democratic senator from New York, that would um, reenfranchise ex-felons. Uh, so there are some issues that he has a broad, moderate, and even somewhat liberal appeal. Um, and I, I think he's a brilliant, brilliant guy, and he's a strong, uh, strong character in the Republican field right now. Ethan, should Democrats be afraid of him? Uh, no. He's a smart guy. He's not going to win the nomination. Uh, Republican. Uh, mainstream establishment will coalesce against him if he gets any momentum, and if he accesses the mainstream, it means he's alienating his base. All right, that's why call it, we call it rapid fire. <laughs> the Russian hackers behind a November cyber attack at the State Department hacked into sensitive parts of the White House computer system. Ethan, how will this intrusion affect the already, already fragile relationship that President Obama and Vladimir Putin have? Well, right now they're not interacting at all, so I can't see them it getting much worse between the two of them. That said, how is our cybersecurity fail so often? Good point, Nate. Um, I, I think our relations right now are even worse than they were on House of Cards this season. Um, I think the broader problem here is that when you have, uh, this is the information age. We know that Russia is trying to hack our stuff. We know that China is trying to hack our, our corporations and our government. And at the same time, you have the Secretary of State using a, a personal email for all of her correspondences. And even if there were not classified documents in those emails that very likely could have been hacked, uh, any personal information about one of the nation's top leaders and a probable Democratic uh, presidential nominee is it's extremely troublesome. I think that's the broader issue that this points to. Mm -hmm. 
All right, and comedian John Oliver of HBO mm -hmm. surprised the world when he traveled to Moscow to interview NSA leaker Edward Snowden. Oliver argued that people have lost interest in government surveillance and that the potential threats it poses and suggested some rather humorous tactics Snowden could use to get people's attention. Nate, has the public lost interest in this issue? Um, I, I think there's just so many things swirling around at any one time that it's, it, it is hard to keep a handle on all of them at once. Um, I think John Oliver's hilarious. I love shows like him, uh, Colbert, Jon Stewart. My problem is that when people take them as a legitimate source of news and information, uh, I think it would be much more valuable if Snowden sat down with CNN or MSNBC even, you know, a, a legitimate news source, New York Times maybe. Yeah. Um, if he wants to get his message out, I think there are much more... Uh, much better avenues for doing so. Ethan, do you think the public has lost interest in the issue of government surveillance? I think to an extent. Um, when this news first broke, when Snowden first released this data, it was very much uh, one of the biggest concerns that we had. And now think mm -hmm. about the last time you heard anyone discuss uh, NSA surveillance or PRISM or any of their programs as a top level uh, concern for the American public. Mm -hmm. uh, the government and the people who support have done a great job pushing it under the rug in a way, just getting it out of the mainstream media. All right, well, it was definitely a very funny interview. I think we can all agree on that. Definitely. And with that, we'll end our debate here on Colonial Crossfire. Thank mm -hmm. you so much to Ethan and Nate for joining us. When we come back, Casey Decker has our debate fact check. buzz started for me out on the line outside of the Barclay Center. You know, a lot of GW alumni filtering in. I'm just so proud to be an alumni and be a part of this movement. There hasn't been a team like this in seven, eight, nine years. I'd say we probably have over a thousand people here and every, you can feel the energy. I graduated in 1991. I graduated in 2009. I graduated in 2005 from Elliott School. The School of Medicine and Health Sciences. From the Columbian College. If you want a place to be in the world tonight, it's right here with all of our alumni, students, parents, friends of the George Washington University. It's just important to have a community that supports our student athletes. I love this team and I, you know, I'm proud to support it. Everyone that's participated and made this happen knows it didn't happen overnight. What we're trying to do is develop students and, and student athletes to really impact the world. This is an even better turnout than last year. The first thing it can really do for us is get our name out there. Applications the next year go through the roof. Tonight you are the George Washington University. It raises the school spirit and makes us all proud to be Colonials. And uh, you have really galvanized our whole university community. You're building a spirit and you're building a family within the university stronger than we've ever had before. Gentlemen, go out there and raise high. Crank it up. Raise high. Raise high. Win, baby. Crank it up. Raise high, the buff and blue. Welcome back. During our panel discussion, a team of fact checkers monitored our debate. Casey Decker is here to fill us in on what we missed. Casey? Thanks, Andrew. First off, we have our liberal commentator, Ethan, who mentioned the federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which he said was passed in 1992. The law was actually passed in 93. Our conservative panelist, Nate, said the lawsuits brought against businesses for refusing to provide wedding-related services to same-sex couples were dismissed. However, individual courts have ruled at least two bakeries who refused to sell same-sex couples wedding cakes discriminated illegally, and one of those bakeries was fined for their actions. Nate also made reference to U.S. Senator Cory Booker. Nate said the senator is from New York. He's actually from New Jersey. That's it from the fact check desk, but Andrew, I've got to brag a little bit. Duke won it all. Did I call it or did I call it? I, I will concede that. Thanks, Casey. And now Spilled Milk. Here's our tribute to the very best of late night political comedy. No milk today, my love is gone away. The bottle stands so long, the symbol of the dawn. But the agreement could be derailed by congressional Republicans. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's, that's, are you really saying anything there? I mean, but the agreement could be derailed by congressional Republicans is like the political version of saying in bed after you read your fortune cookies. It's, you will meet your true love and share a happy future. 
but the agreement could be derailed by congressional <laughs> Republicans. Mm. This Sunday is the premiere of Game of Thrones. This season focuses on a woman from a once powerful family who will stop at nothing to claim her rightful place on the throne, based on the true story of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I guess that does explain Hillary's new campaign slogan, Winter is Coming. <laughs> Actually, I read that President Obama has now visited every state in the U.S. except for South Dakota. But he's visited Afghanistan four times. <laughs> Which explains South Dakota's new tourism slogan, South Dakota, not as fun as Afghanistan. <laughs> According to the New York Times, Jeb Bush identified himself as Hispanic <laughs> on a 2009 voter registration form while Hillary Clinton identified herself as president. <laughs> At Friday prayers, there was the usual chant of death to America, but more habit than conviction. Well, that's good, I guess. More habits than conviction. You know, like an atheist saying, God bless you when you sneeze. <laughs> all right, well, that's all for this episode of Colonial Crossfire. For all the latest updates from our political team at any time, be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. For all of us here at GW-TV, I'm Andrew Desiderio. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. Have a great summer, GW. We'll see you next year.